IVT's Validation Week returns in person this October, and it'll also be held virtually. This is the gold standard event for quality and validation professionals. Prepare to zero in on proven strategies for achieving regulatory compliance and educational training with top industry experts to ensure quality across the life sciences. Taking place in a hybrid format, in person October 19th to 21st in Philadelphia, and virtually October 26th to 28th. You'll have your top concerns addressed by key opinion leaders and benefit from benchmarking and knowledge sharing on the most critical topics in process validation, computer system validation, cleaning validation, equipment qualification, data integrity, and much more. This uniquely formatted event provides opportunity for all to gain the necessary training and discuss the most crucial topics in validation today. Plus, you can earn GMP training hours while attending. Validation Week 2021 is an event you cannot afford to miss. Visit informaconnect.com slash ValWeek for full details on the agenda, registration, and team rates. This is Voices in Validation, brought to you by IVT Network. IVT Network is your expert source for life science regulatory knowledge. Voices in Validation brings you the best in validation and compliance topics. We interview industry experts from pharma, biotech, med devices, and laboratories. Here is the host of Voices in Validation, Stacy. Thank you, and welcome to another episode of Voices in Validation, brought to you by the IVT Network. Batch production is time-consuming, yet remains a popular and time-tested method used in the pharmaceutical manufacturing industry today. But some industry leaders, along with the FDA, have taken steps toward or are now contemplating a shift to continuous manufacturing. And this means that all stages of drug production run through the final product without a stop during its production, thus shutting the shutdown of equipment between batches um, you know, is not required, which eliminates downtime. So continuous manufacturing, which we'll refer to here as CM, saves time and reduces the likelihood for human error. But Uh, Is it realistic at this point in time to expect that the majority of our pharmaceutical manufacturers are moving in this direction or prepared to? So today, we're going to discuss the pros and cons of transitioning to a continuous manufacturing system with our guest, Renee Phillips. Welcome, Renee. It's so great to have you with us here. Thanks, Stacey. It's really good to be with you and have this discussion. Absolutely. Absolutely. And And I want to say up front, I do appreciate... Uh, your expertise around this. It is a topic that a lot of our listeners are very interested in. So to kick us off, uh, can you provide an overview of continuous manufacturing in pharma and update our listeners on this increasing push for the industry to switch to a more automated process? Sure, sure. So continuous manufacturing, you know, at the conceptual level is a a type of operation, a mode of operation, where there's a steady stream input of materials and energy into an automated integrated system, whereby transformation takes place and those input materials return on the other end, they exit the system as some product in some form or another, right? So ideally, a continuous system is operating at a steady state without interruptions, you know, continuous input, continuous output, right? The constancy of flow of materials and energy over time. So in pharmaceutical manufacturing world, the concept is the same, right? Continuous flow of excipients and API into a system, we're processing those materials, and then <laughs> is our intended product. So significantly though, uh, CM necessitates more in terms of automation in the line because this is a continuous integrated thing. And so process analytical tools and process analytical technology, for example, and often process modeling and control, real-time tracking and tracing of the materials. And and the software that runs it all is all integrated and is part of continuous manufacturing. Okay. Uh, There is a push to move uh, pharma in the direction of CM. And, you know, some have noted that this push is coming strongly from FDA. Right. Uh, certainly there are benefits like, you know, real savings over time and, and companies know this, right? 
materials, time, you know, possibly labor savings can be realized with CM. So those are always of interest to a business. But with FDA, I think they see continuous manufacturing as a means to potentially reduce product shortages, to enhance operations. And they latched onto this idea that product quality can be improved by going through that process of converting over from traditional batch manufacturing to continuous manufacturing. All right. And these are all very good reasons for a health authority to be on board with this new technology. Right. I mean, it sounds like obviously it would be much more efficient uh, in the end and that, you know, one of uh, the byproducts is the elimination of human error, I would think. So I can see the justification from the FDA um, and, and the interest on the side of the manufacturers. But let's talk a little bit about the advantages and disadvantages of um, CM versus our traditional batch manufacturing. Sure, sure. So, you know, as I mentioned, the, you know, obvious advantages are the time and material savings, right? Mm-hmm. I recently read a statistic that the industry loses something like $50 billion a year on general inefficiencies in manufacturing. I was really surprised by that. Um, the figure did include things, of course, like shipping losses and product recalls, but equipment downtime and material waste, that was all part of it, right? So mm-hmm. when we talk about advantages, we immediately think of material savings, less downtime between runs, right, as with traditional batch production, um, possibly decreased energy expenditures, so our utilities and water and things like that, right. um, footprint. Uh, and actual time savings for the product runs. We have seen product campaigns in some cases reduced from weeks to days, right? So another big advantage for us is that there are fewer people involved in continuous manufacturing or or fewer places where human intervention is required. So we expect to see that reduction of human error. And, you know, CM, of course, as we mentioned, and we'll talk more about this later, uses more automated monitoring techniques, which often come with predictive, you know, maintenance schedules, making planning for downtime a lot easier. Mm-hmm. Right? Some of the disadvantages, all right, so the big one, we'll start with the big one right up front. It's the initial capital expenditure for equipment, right? CM is a lot of money and it's usually a lot more than what we see with traditional batch manufacturing lines. So that upfront investment for a company will be significant. Um, and we have to include not just the cost of that equipment and lines, but those labor costs that come up front, right? Because engineering is going to be required for installation and for startup. And so we, uh, you know, also have to consider, too, that any kind of malfunction can possibly shut down an entire CM line for some period of time. Contrast that a little bit with traditional batch manufacturing where alternate lines or pieces of equipment may be qualified and used in manufacturing, right? So you can you can kind of you can get you can put pinch hitters in there in, in some right. cases. With regard to the equipment functionality, although you know the the CM often the software does come with the use of you know automated monitoring techniques, setting that maintenance schedule on a CM line is another thing that really does have to be carefully considered and planned, right? Because all equipment needs some maintenance and deciding when to intentionally shut down a continuous manufacturing operation can be tricky and has to be carefully balanced against a production schedule, particularly if we're talking about CM lines for a very in-demand product where lines really do run continuously. It can be a challenge to build inventory in cases like that. Another disadvantage of continuous manufacturing is that customization is not really an easy thing once the line and process has been established. The line will be built and be validated to a product with very specific properties and specifications. So altering those is not a simple undertaking. And companies need to be very sure, very clear about the product or properties intended for that continuous manufacturing setup. Um, you know, and uh, interesting from a regulatory perspective, we don't have harmonized global guidelines on CM yet, right? So that could cause companies to to take a pause when they're considering how well received uh, CM product will be to global health authorities. Uh, I will say that, you know, EMA and PMDA are very much in line with FDA thinking on continuous manufacturing. But when we take a look at the other regions of the world, there's some uncharted territory, sure. right? 
Of course, we know ICH weighed in back in 2018 when they announced that they were intending to put out a guidance document called Q13, which is supposed to cover both the manufacture of drug substances and drug product for continuous manufacturing. And, and we're watching that pretty closely now as the meetings to finalize that guidance are still ongoing even this month. So, um, you know, conversion to CM you know, certainly does require revalidation and new pre-market regulatory approvals, which companies have to factor in as part of overall planning. Um, you know, so far we have, you know, seen the conversion of CM. It's taken place really for solid API manufacture and for solid uh, oral dosage drug products. So processes associated with the manufacture of both of those things like feed blending, wet granulation, tableting, fluid bed drying, and, and crystallization are some of the operations that we've seen convert pretty nicely from traditional to CM. Right. And because as you alluded to, there's not a lot of customization that needs to happen there. Um, and it's, it's, uh, large facilities that are set up for the purposes of running these particular products, which are well suited to CM, I, I imagine. Um, and just thinking about uh, the pros and cons that you listed, obviously, you know, it's great when we can reduce the time to market and get uh, drugs to the consumers quicker, um, especially when some of those drugs are, you know, hard to come by or take a long time to produce historically. So that's great. But the upfront costs that you mentioned um, can really be prohibitive at this point in time. And I and I'm guessing that uh, it's even more of a deterrent for companies who have equipment that's on the newer side or systems that, you know, aren't really ready to be retired because now here's an investment of sure. new dollars and resources, you know, time and money sure. um, when they don't really see uh, an immediate benefit for it. So um, it, it definitely, there's definitely a lot to weigh. There is, there is, and 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 that's right. We, you know, you have to make a pretty good business case for, you know, can, for making that switch. And, absolutely, and, absolutely. And so, uh, you know, so, there's a, some funny things, you know, some some pretty ironic things about a lot of uh, traditional batch manufacturing that could benefit from from converting over. But as we mentioned, you know, the big, the the big disadvantage, the biggest one at the moment, I think, is the cost. Right, right. And it sounds that. Yeah. Um, so, Renee, you did mention, you know, uh, some of the guide guidances uh, or guide, you know, um, guidelines that people should consider in the planning process. And I want to talk a little bit more about um, GMP guidelines mm -hmm. for both, you know, both batch manufacturing and CM, uh, of course, are subject to the same stringent quality control. Right. Um, so can you talk about the holistic control strategies of continuous manufacturing, um, you know, highlight maybe some of the quality indicators and, um, and, and talk about how to make cr critical quality attributes tunable so that the system can find the conditions at which it needs to operate in order to ensure, you know, the final product quality, because those are certainly important components of CM. All right, sure, sure. This is a there's a thing you know, this is a big one to unpack, right? So yes. uh um, you know, controlling variation, of course, in any process is going to be paramount for product quality, right? right. In order to meet spec. And we know that to be true for you know traditional batch manufacturing, and it's also true for continuous. So you know, as you mentioned, there's definitely crossover and duplication of controls for both traditional and, and, and continuous. But the difference, one of the big differences is that, of course, continuous has to monitor and control the process end to end as a whole ongoing, right? CM does not, uh, or, or CM does provide, rather, an opportunity to design controls into the system rather than relying on testing at the end of the process or at, you know, certain endpoints in the process. Right, that same conversion of operation in batch mode to continuous mode can be implemented for quality controls, and and a control strategy is certainly unique to every product and process on CM. Right, so there's no one size fits all. Mm -hmm. So you know, <clears throat> guidelines. We speak about guidelines. FDA, of course, has put out a guideline uh, about you know 
continuous manufacturing, and it's, it's referenced, you know, quite a bit and used quite a bit. And and what FDA has outlined, um, what they see as control strategy pillars for continuous manufacturing, and, and and there's a lot of discussion and a lot of talk about it. But but really, FDA's put this out and said, you know, we think there's about you know seven items that are super important. We want you to keep in mind when you're designing control strategy, right? And so that first one. Uh, you know, is materials, right? Relationship between materials, material characteristics, properties to the process, to the manufacturing process has to be thoroughly vetted and understood, right? Mm -hmm. So we know, obviously, in, in no matter what kind of manufacturing you're doing, understanding your material properties and characteristics is important, right? So particle size and density and flow, all important, no matter what. But super important is in continuous because we know that there's a material inflow into the system that's just ongoing. And 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 sometimes and it does. It frequently, you know, frequently you can see a little bit of um, uh, unintended consequences or disturbances. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. But particularly if the material spans different lots in a run, the process has to be robust enough to accommodate that kind of variation in raw materials, you know, both excipient and API. Right. So materials is highlighted as something that FDA really wants us to focus on as part of this control strategy, right? Which can be difficult if you're dealing, I would assume if you're dealing with multiple vendors for specific APIs or, yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. And I, you know, um, I think there's, uh, you know, that's a that's another, that's another challenge to, you know, to be, um, uh, you know, to be discussed and, and, and really kind of teased out is when you're talking about using, you know, most of us think, well, we use the same vendor, but maybe variable lots. If you're talking about vendor to vendor variability, I mean, that, you know, that's a whole other, it's like, a, it's like another step up, right? So right. very important for us to, to really understand material characteristics as they fit into the process. Um, process monitoring. All right. So controlling our product quality with respect to variation and in, in, in materials, the process itself, equipment and the other environmental factors is, is absolutely the goal. Uh, by its nature of the many moving parts, you know, CM lends itself to that incorporation of control from the beginning mm -hmm. and as a constant rather than being a start-stop test, a start-stop test, which is the scheme that we're used to in traditional batch manufacturing. Right. So this is where our PAT tools come into play, you know, big time with, with CM and where they are generating the real-time data on the whole process. The materials, the run itself, and the various iterations of the product, whether that be work in progress, you know, or, or the finished product, um, or both in most cases. Uh, the FDA guidance on CM really does lay out nicely what is it, the expected minimum uh, inclusion, right? Minimum items for inclusion in process monitoring. So things like variables and, and sampling plan and the types of analysis. But another facet of process monitoring that speaks to the efficiency of CM is that capability of making adjustments in real time on the line. And, and you know, this, this speaks to, um, you know, your question about attuning, attuning those, you know, variables uh, or attributes in, in real time. Right. Um, you know, limits of the process would certainly have to be established already, and they are, but that kind of flexibility is not really seen too much in traditional batch manufacturing. So all of it has to be balanced against risk, mm -hmm. um, and clear written procedures have to be in place. And, and, and as I mentioned, you know, parameters, being that ability to tune parameters in order to yield product that meets specification right on the line is, is, is really beneficial, right? <clears throat> yeah, I mean, it's it takes, I would think it's a very difficult, uh, it's much more difficult to get that ahead of time set up that because you're really, you know, um, having to make sure the entire life cycle of the product, or at least the whole manufacturing life cycle is accounted for upfront, as opposed to when you're batch manufacturing, right? And you alluded to this, you can um, run the first part of the process and then test. Is yep. everything the way we yep. expect? Okay, now we're moving on to the second part of the process and we'll test. But all of that testing and all of that planning needs to happen up front. Um, and it sure. makes it that much more uh, time consuming, but um, challenging to implement, I would think. Yeah, yeah. A lot, a lot of, a lot of, um, you know, pre, pre work is done. I mean, there, it, I think I, I, I don't, I don't think we can underestimate how much time it really takes 
to to set up all of that and to you know explore the boundaries and figure out the parameters of the process and uh, upfront. It, it really is super time consuming. Right. So, Not necessary to this whole process monitoring. Absolutely. Can't do it without <laughs> it. Right. So um how about things that we talk about or, or, or you know terms that you'll see in the guidance document and, and certainly if you're you know reading anything about continuous manufacturing and um, is a disturbance, right? So right. disturbance is, uh, you know, defined as something in the system and it's it's with respect to that steady state of operation and operating in a state of control, which we expect CM to do. But disturbances are monitored. They have to be monitored and understood. And, 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 and when we say disturbance, it's, you know, something unexpected that's happening. We have to be able to detect it along the line, any place along the line, because, you know, uh, in some cases, you could, you know, get an OOS, or depending on the intensity of disturbance of that and the re- process robustness, it could be absorbed, right? But we just have to be able to pinpoint where things are, and so detection is really important. And disturbances along the manufacturing flow, you know, um, uh, need to be, you know, pinpointed, categorized, known up front. Everybody, you know, we know them. It's part of the batch record. It's it is common to see disturbances at the inflow of materials, often within or around blending and granulation operations. So, you know, I think folks who are um, already up and running with CM, they you know have a lot of experience with that. And and so, if the process is robust enough, you know, and as I mentioned, just depending because we one of the other things FDA talks about is materials, and, and we'll get there. Material diversion, we you know start up operations and shut down operations. We know what's happening. We know where there are, you know, blips and, and what kind of, you know, where the parameters are. So really, really interesting stuff. Um, system dynamics uh, is another term. Monitoring things like how long the materials remain in one step to another uh, in right up to the final exit of the system is, is another kind of study that has to be undertaken. And it takes some time to get that traceability of materials in a system, right? Material can be tracked in the system as a function of time and differentiated from lot to lot. There's something called RTD, residence time distribution. You'll see that in the guidance and also in the discussions about CM. Uh, used to describe traceability, right? Certainly a feature that we will need for quality purposes. And, you know, and when we talk about, we, we get to the, the third pillar of, of the control strategy. So <clears throat> material diversion which, you know, I kind of lump in with refilling and shutdown and and startup. I think they're kind of interrelated concepts in some ways when we talk about the control strategy and, you know, refilling of a materials feeder certainly needs to be on a schedule, right? And the way in which the refill is conducted can affect performance and product quality. So disturbances, even the small ones, are usually introduced around this operation is very important to understand and control the manner in which the materials are fed into the system. So, um, you know, we aim to characterize the process parameters for these operations so that our materials and or, or whatever is happening there is not of an unknown quality, right? right. We, you know, quantifying the amounts of that material lost from the startup and shutdown is, is necessary and useful. And I mean, that's necessary and useful anyway, no matter what, even if you're talking about traditional batch manufacturing, but right. super important here, right? When we're talking about savings. Um, uh, material diversion is where the non-conforming material can be removed from the batch, right? Sounds like a simple idea, and I guess conceptually it is a simple idea. Maybe in practice not as easy, but again, uh, you know, these, these automated monitoring tools, you know, make it possible. We know that the non-conforming material, will, you know, was, is going to show up from time to time especially from disturbances or those startup and shutdown. And so the process monitoring things like RTD forms that foundation for diversion, segregation, removal of any non-conformances. So that's pretty important. Those two things are very important as part of our control strategy, understanding where where we may see things that, you know, uh, affect the process and we are able to, you know, uniquely, you know, isolate them and remove them if that be the case. Yeah. And then is that done, you know, sort of in real time without stopping the rest of the process or is this a, require a shutdown? What? Yeah. Have- so that's an interesting question. Um, <laughs> you know, um, I, okay. So I've actually, I actually know that both have happened. I think the ideal is that the shut, you know, we don't shut down. We keep going. 
you're able to track and trace and keep it keep it keep it moving. Just right. push off the lawn, whatever is not good. Um, when uh, from personal experience, we you know I, I, first time uh, I think the non-conforming materials came down, everybody sort of panicked and turned the off button and said, "Let's move, let's remove it out." So okay, but I, in an ideal situation, you your your RTD, your your PAT, all of that is identifying the stuff that not doesn't meet the specs. Right. And in that case, we're able to, you know, either you know, cal shoot it out a different way, or isolate it as it comes out of that particular step. Right. So it's probably a case by case basis, depending on yeah what's causing the disturbance uh, and how much of it there is, right? Because there can be, I guess. Minute amounts of uh, materials that are causing a problem, or it could be the entire batch of API that you that you dumped in. So I, exactly. I would think it, you'd have to kind of assess that as a as a one off each time. Exactly, and hopefully it's it's not the entire batch of API, and rather you know something else has happened. You know, but yeah, both of those. I mean, in a, in, in the ideal, the the tools would be able to identify that. And we'll be able to remove it. So no matter if it's two pieces or, you know, 400 kilograms, whatever. Right, right, right. Exactly. Because that is the whole point of CM here, that we just yeah. keep moving. Yeah, keep moving, <laughs> keep moving. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Um, and so we're, we're, that's the third pillar. So we're moving on to the fourth pillar of the seven here, which I think is real-time release testing. Can you talk a little more about that? Yeah, sure, sure. Real time release testing is a, is a very cool idea, right? So, all the data that we're collecting uh, during our, our CM process can support real time release testing, right? And in the guidance document, FDA makes clear that you know it's not really a requirement. It's po- you know it's it is possible to include as a control strategy if we give some extra consideration uh, to things like sampling. Um, and the use of multivariate analytical testing, mm-hmm. right? So for the sampling piece, the expectation is that samples are going to be collected at the critical points in the process. And certainly there's a lot of work to be done up front and prior to even implementing your time release testing. So things like the critical quality attributes of the product and all the product characteristics have to be well-defined and known. Um, and the expected behavior of the product subject to full analytical testing um, in order to draw equivalency to what they call surrogate testing can be implemented as part of this real-time release testing. The guidance document does spell out some specific expectations around predictive tests for content uniformity and assay um, using, you know, near infrared and and also identity testing is addressed, right? So it, it's a it's a very cool concept when we think about, you know, in the traditional way, you know, we pull samples off the line and they go to the laboratory and they're, you know, they they they're tested for how, however many, you know, points we have on a C of A, right? And here we're talking about, you know, installing automation and PAT that will allow, you know, that will look at the product you know, in place as it's coming through the line and be able to make, you know, uh, you know, it's going to give us a value about, you know, content you or identity. I mean, this is just, this is, it's, it's almost like a futuristic, but it's here. It's it's possible. So um, it's really, it's really a neat thing. Uh, So, and there's a lot of work that has to be done, right? So first of all, establishing these, you know, these surrogate tests is a big deal. And then of course, drawing the equivalency to our traditional, you know, HPLC assays or whatever else we're doing that we would normally do in the laboratory. So in order to be able to, to make that equivalency, you've got to prove that first and then and then be able to rely on the real-time release testing. So Right. And so, you know, they're thinking ahead of time and they're coding all of that in, right? What to look for, mm-hmm. where where to test, what, you know. So um, a lot of this is automated because yep. clearly we're using, you know, AI, computers, et cetera. But someone had to think about that and make those, put those parameters in play to begin with. Right, um, right. Yeah. Um, again, points to how much time up front this process takes, but once it's moving, you know, I can imagine that um, you start to see an ROI relatively quickly. <clears throat> yes. I mean, I mean, thinking about, right. Thinking about 
all the years that you know you you spend waiting for the lab results to come back before you can do batch release. This is something out. I mean, this is like um, it's really it's such a such a benefit. Yeah, you know, yeah, and yeah, and and are right when you're talking about making the business case. Wow, the, if the finance folks can really understand. You know, and they do. They, they they put it down to dollars and cents, right? With how much you know, head counts and hours spent doing stuff. It's really it. It, it can be it for a for an in demand high volume product. This this could be really, really beneficial. For sure. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um. Uh, another the other uh, you know big uh, pillar or mainstay of 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 control strategy is the specifications. So that's you know product specs and quality standards you know developed in CM you know have the same quality attributes as product developed on traditional right. So there isn't a fundamental difference in the concept. Uh, you know, and FDA actually in the even in this guidance document even references to eleven sixty five, which talks about you know requirements for you know testing and release for distribution. So there's there's, there's no let up right. We are expected to do the same thing, but. Where, where the difference is, is that these non-traditional analytical methods and acceptance criteria uh, cannot be used to demonstrate compliance in, in, in continuous manufacturing. So, you know, that's where, again, the PAT and this real-time release testing come in. It's, 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 really, it's really beneficial, right? So, as we discussed, there's so many, there's a, there's a lot of savings to be gained in terms of, you know, even just time. You just isolate one thing. It's the, the time that you're saving is incredible. Um, don't forget, though, you know, that <clears throat> traditional offline testing, you know, is always still possible when we're, we're, we're thinking about, you know, uh, you know, backups. Of course, we can, you know, still do things the old fashioned way. Um, and that would be that would be, of course, great. Uh, well, it wouldn't be good for us if we had a problem on the CM line, but it's good for us to have as a backup. It's right? a good frame of reference, right? Yeah. 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 Um, equipment uh, is another thing the, the FDA talks about and, you know, points out the control strategy, right? And, and, and because we are expecting, you know, equipment on a CM line to run for extended periods of time without interruption, the, the normal wear and tear may not be observed on these shorter development runs that we're doing when we're engineering and we're starting up, right? So for this reason, you know, FDA speaks about the qualification of equipment. Uh, it has to be addressed in twofold. You know, they want to, they want you to qualify and understand fully know the equipment as a single operating unit, and then of course as part of an integrated system. So you know, two two things to look at. Much of what we already do in equipment qualification studies for traditional is is also conducted for CM. So you know, pl- flow rates and pressures and speeds and you know all that kind of stuff. That is that's sort of universal. Um, but in this case, the monitoring that's taking place over this extended period of time. And, and to be clear, and I, you know, I, extended is going to be different for every product and process, but extended period of time um, to, as the CM line is running, right? And so in conjunction with the product and the process parameters and specs, performance of our equipment is what we're supposed to be observing, right? And certainly if we see abnormal performance, you know, we should be able to, to see that pretty quickly too, considering the, the, uh, the, um, the, the, the automated tools. Um, with equipment, you know, comes maintenance and calibration and cleaning schedules, right? So these all have to be used to um, develop um, you know, uh, our, our schedules and with any piece of equipment expectation is that the control strategy includes knowing the limits of the equipment performance and, and any possible failure modes. So, um, the approach, to, the approach to, to cleaning and the cleaning schedules is much like the maintenance and preventive maintenance too, right? So how is, what is product quality looking like over time, right? When we look, we're going to look for things that are, possibly drifting, going out of spec or, or going, you know, looking for things like in case of cleaning material buildup, right. In the right. system or on the monitoring equipment, right. Microbial growth certainly of course has to be monitored and, and, and all as part of, as part of that general well being of equipment timetables for cleaning and preventive maintenance have to be developed with experience on the line. You know, it's not really possible to anticipate 
all the areas where things could wear out or break or, or need a good clean on day one, right? So certainly, um, you know, it's, it, it's not obvious in the short term. And, and so certainly, you know, known things like equipment design have to be used in tandem with experience on our equipment in order to develop all of that, you know, those protocols that we need. So uh, equipment is also a big focus, right? As part of control strategy, FDI says you better know everything about your equipment up and down, you know, crossways. Uh, and, and you have to, you have to. So You have to because you're relying 100% on your equipment and uh, your software to do right. the entire yeah. process. Once you set the wheels in motion, like... Now it's all up to the equipment and the software. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the final pillar of our control strategy is uh, something called system integration, data processing and management, right? And, you know, because we're developing this control strategy on continuous manufacturing, right? And we know that it's an integrated system. You know, for the we, you know, to output our product in a continuous steady state, the expectation is that the system is robust and well defined, right? And, and and as you can and in a way you can kind of see how this is all wrapping up the other six things we talked about previously. Right. So um, you know, we prove system integration through our setup engineering and invalidation studies, which certainly should demonstrate the functionality of the whole system to work as designed and produce product according to our specs. Um, usually the, the CM line by its very nature, um, you know, uh, engenders more operator observation than intervention, right? So we expect that, and we expect that with higher functioning automation, right? And we talked right. a little bit about the reduction of human error. So part of the control strategy for integrated systems includes features that do alert operators, right? When systems not operating within our prescribed limits and, and certainly all responses by our quality group to those kinds of alerts have to be appropriate to the event. And of course, that's something uniquely developed by each company for each process, right? So in terms of the data, continuous manufacturing generates an awful lot of electronic data from you know, the various pieces of automation. Yeah. And, and that electronic data is driving operational decisions made by quality. In, in many, many cases, so so it's understood there's a relationship between quality oversight online and that data that's coming out. And for this reason, FDA deems it very critical that quality be a part of that system and the software design. So electronic data generated has to be compliant with Part 11, of course. And since we're talking about batch records and in-process data, real-time testing, you know, all of those things, things that we know from Part 11, like audit trail, version control, right. security, unique uh, sign-on, and archiving and backup all have to be part of that automation and software of the integrated CM line. Exactly. So that part doesn't go away. It's the, nope. you know, the process might look a little different, but mm -hmm. it's happening uh, whether you're doing batch manufacturing or continuous manufacturing. Right. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So Renee, I mean, this, that was a lot. Those seven pillars covered a lot of information and we really got to see why, you know, the process controls and the strategies are, are very detailed and highly important. So, you know, we will provide some additional explanations through our show notes. So I don't want our, our listeners to feel like, whoa, they, we, they're, they're lost now. Um, so we will, we will uh, provide that. But um, thinking about everything you just um, covered, I want to dive in a little bit more on um, on real time monitoring and th this whole system design up front. So unlike the current GMP structure, where the manufacturing process and quality management are separated, QBD or quality by design systems can simultaneously perform real time monitoring during the entire life cycle. Can you talk a little bit about why that's so important to the CM process? Sure, sure, yeah, um, definitely. Uh, real time, uh, you know, that that monitoring, that real time monitoring is is critical, right? So, so when we think about a CM line, so much can be gleaned from the output of data 
uh, that's going on and that, you know, so we know, we, we know what's happening in real time with the system and with the product that's in there or the work, you know, wherever, whatever stages the product is in. Right. And, and, and that kind of automation, you know, certainly fulfills quality requirements, not as well as giving us a, a, a good picture of what's happening. So, you know, when we think of traditional batch manufacturing, we know that, you know, samples are collected from those various critical points along the line. And those samples are sent to the laboratory and they're tested and the results come back. There's an analysis by QA and, and then perhaps an investigation or a cap. I mean, you know, there's a whole litany of things that can happen before we reach that final disposition, right? So these are a series of succinct steps taking some time to complete, right? That's traditional. Fundamentally, continuous manufacturing is different in that way. And QBD does a great job of highlighting how, right? So if we take just a couple of examples, right? So Take the manufacturing process itself, right? Contrast the, the traditional approach to fixing something broken or, or non-functional with the continuous approach, which is adjusting in that space uh, of the process, up or down, whatever it may be, to allow for those controlled corrections, as we talked about, to achieve conforming material, right? Then, you know, think about the approach even to product development, right? That can be compared and highlighted using QPD, right? Traditional, we tend to set up these, you know, empirical design of experiments. We focus on a fix. Whereas in continuous manufacturing, the pharmaceutical development is systemic, focusing on a whole robust control strategy and employing multivariate experiments, right? So just, just the, the, the ideology behind the two are, are so different. And, and, um, and QBD is, is, is fantastic for CM, right? So we know that the QBD approach aims to design that quality into the process from the beginning. Right. And engage in continuous improvement. And the way it's done is through a series of, you know, deliberate risk-based actions, varying one attribute, let's say, while holding the others constant. And in this way, we build this base of knowledge, this product knowledge and process knowledge, right? So that the parameters can be set. <laughs> This understanding of the process allows operators to detect drifts and performance and look at failure modes. And just as important, all those possible deviations and unexpected happenings are not really unknowns, right? They've all been previously identified and evaluated as part of that QBD approach to product development, right? So QBD dovetails really nicely with continuous manufacturing in that you almost cannot separate the tenets of QBD and CM, right? right? A lot of overlap between them. At the core, there is that complete understanding of process and the robustness of the process. I, I, I have to tell you, I recently saw a very nice graphical representation of QBD, sort of like a, a, a bullseye target, right? How, and how the QBD and CM fit together. If we think of QBD, uh, in the center of a circular target, things, you know, like the bullseye, things like product design, process design, and, and process performance form an inner circle around QBD, right? Then one more circle out is things like specs, controls, critical quality attributes, and parameters. Right. But then we have a layer of product knowledge and process understanding, right? And then all of it fits into this big circle which is called continuous improvement, right? And it's, it's such a good visual. I mean, I think that's one of the things you could probably link for the for folks. It's such a good visual and really shows how these two things fit together perfectly. You know, so the QBD, there's there, to me, there's no, um, there's you know, there's, there's no conflict of interest, right, with with QBD and CM. These are these are um, they go hand in hand. They really do. They right? really go and hand in that, hand. I'm just picturing with that. Um, image that you just conjured with the circles, each layer, I feel like the more knowledge you have, so the, the wider that ring gets of knowledge about your product and your processes, right? Um, the easier it is to build that quality in from the beginning, because you know exactly, exactly what to expect. If something's going to go wrong, you know where it's going to go wrong, and you're already going to know what you're going to do to remediate it, right? Yeah, so, yeah, exactly. Exactly right. I yeah. love that. So Renee, you know, we hear, when we hear about continuous manufacturing, we also know that there are some environmental benefits uh, to CM as well. Can you talk a little bit more about 
um, you know, the environmental impacts or the eco-friendly um, outcomes that we might expect with CM? Sure. Sure. Uh, yeah. Environmental factors are certainly um, a concern. You know, everybody's in tune with, you know, carbon footprint, pollution, with climate change, you know. So, uh, you know, as I mentioned a little earlier, definitely a reduction of resources right. used in continuous manufacturing. Things like electricity and water are the obvious ones, but still very impactful. Um, I recently saw a statistic about Sanofi's plant in Framingham, Massachusetts, mm -hmm. where the CM line has reduced water and chemical usage by over 90%. That is huge. That is huge. <laughs> it's huge. So it's amazing, right? On top of that, they also monitored or evaluated uh, a reduction of CO2 emissions out of the plant, right? So, yeah. and it was also a big number. It was something like 80%. That's amazing. It, so, so this is, these are really, these are really kind of, uh, this is important. And it, again, just, you know, put it in the column of, you know, pros for CM. Um, relatedly, I want to tell you, there's a movement called green chemistry. And this has a lot of crossover potential to a pharma continuous manufacturing world, right? Green chemistry is a position that was originally championed by the American Chemical Society. And of course, there's, you know, Royal Society of Chemistry, a lot of, a lot of chemical societies around the world that love green chemistry, but it was, I think, an ACS thing first. And the emphasis, of course, is placed on uh, reducing pollutants and improving all of, you know, production processes so that we get on a path to seriously pare down process and, and, and by product waste. Creation of alternatives to hazardous substances is another feature of green chemistry. Right. You know, and I know we tend to think about industrial chem application when we, we talk about ACS or about green chemistry, but these concepts around reduction of toxic byproducts or, or savings of resources are certainly so applicable to pharma and to pharmacy, right? Right. So as a tie-in with process improvements made during the conversion to CM, a reduction of synthetic steps, solvent-free synthesis, and, and a general push to move away from stoichiometric and non-selective reagents is also present in pharma now, right? And we know that conventional chemical reactions, oxidation, hydrogenation, and ring closing metasynthesis are used in pharma manufacturing, particularly in API manufacturing. Mm -hmm. So th this is important, right? And something called biocatalysis, which is using enzymes for catalytic reactions, is seen as a good alternative in some cases, especially since enzymes are biodegradable and often produced in a renewable way. So this is seen as sustainable and less environmentally impactful. Yeah, That's all, great. all good stuff. Yeah, <laughs> no, I love it. And I lo a lot of times some of this green chemistry just goes back to nature itself. And we watch, you know, how the ocean historically has cleaned itself or different things like that and or, or fish. Um, and they get some of these ideas. And, and the more that we can use that in our pharmaceutical and other manufacturing, too, we're talking about pharmaceutical today, but this applies elsewhere, um, the better off we are as um, as a global industry, because we certainly are having a negative impact sometimes on the environment. And um, yeah. yeah, if we can shift away from that, that will um, provide huge outcomes for us yeah. across the world. Um, so I love that you mentioned green chemistry. <laughs> I want to um, ask another question about the FDA issued draft guidance, quality considerations for continuous manufacturing, because we are talking about continuous manufacturing, continuous improvement. Um, and that draft guidance actively promotes a shift to CM as, as you already referenced, but mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I've heard some um, pushback or some argue that the FDA perspective may be flawed here. And I wanted to give you an opportunity to talk more about regulatory guidance and, uh, you know, challenges that are related to that. Sure, sure. Oh, yeah, this is a good one. <laughs> All right. So, yeah, so FDA put out that guidance in February of 2019. And, and, and yeah, it's still a draft at this point and probably will be for a long time, as you right. know. Um, uh, importantly, you know, FDA has been involved in the discussion about continuous manufacturing for a number of years now, right? Mm -hmm. And and largely seen as a partner to industry in this venture. So FDA does consider CM an emerging technology and has 
devoted a fair amount of resources to understanding it, framing it, developing it, all with an eye really to regulating it. And so with that in mind, the, the publication of that draft guidance was great in terms of shoring up that commitment by FDA with industry. And as expected, industry did an excellent job of reviewing the guidance and providing feedback on where they see potential obstacles and points needing clarification, right? So a couple of the big notes, you know, the the big things that were brought up was the guidance is solely focused on small molecule solid oral dosage forms. Mm -hmm. There's there's no address of biological product manufacturing for anything that could be submitted under a BLA, let's say. Okay. Interesting because when you read the scope of the guidance, it talks about supporting CM for products submitted under NDA, ANDA, DMF. BLA, and of course, even OTC products. So there's a little bit of a disconnect, right? And the industry has said, hey, would you please clarify here? Um, Another issue is there's some concern that the guidance blurs the line a bit between GMP controls and regulatory submission activity, meaning will activity usually reserved for FDA on plant inspection be required to be included in the authorization application, right? There's a little bit of an unknown. So they're just asking the question. Would right. you please clarify for us what you want, right? Right, right. Process validation was another topic raised by industry. And I, I think the context here is the industry is asking for more flexibility around process validation, you know, um, right when, when it comes to demonstrating that reproducibility and reliability of CM, you know, maybe we need a little bit either more time or we need more parameters and validation, you know, flexibility. Right? Sure. <clears throat> Another issue, FDA has stated that one of the hopes for continuous manufacturing was that there would be a decreased amount of regulatory oversight eventually. Woo! Yeah. And so, so a request was made to see examples of CM line changes and, and what kind of, you know, what category of approval would they fall under, right? What would what would constitute a pre-approval? What would be a CBE 30? You know, there was, there was just, it was just kind of a blank space. And so industry is saying, hey, we would really like to see some examples of that, right? And and then a request for more clarification of terms, right? So uh, ex- runtime extension was one thing they really want FDA to, to put hands around that a little bit better. And the big one was some a term to use in the guidance called batch rejection, which, you know, with respect to higher than usual number of disturbances in a run, uh, FDA says that's automatically going to constitute a rejection, right? So the counter proposal from industry was, well, well, wait a minute. You know, we know that all disturbances have to be investigated and 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 material has to be discarded when it's truly non-conforming. But because we have these tools, you know, the disposition of the material should be based on the ability to segregate out the good from the bad, right? So, I mean, that's the whole idea of material divergence. Right. And it's so, why we're not producing in our traditional batch exactly, manufacturing manner exactly. so that we can make those real-time changes. And maybe yeah. you have to throw out 10 tablets, maybe you have to throw out a thousand, but certainly not an entire run, right? Exactly. And so, you know, industry was saying, hey, FDA, it's a little bit disjointed there because on one hand, you're talking about material divergence. On the other hand, you're talking about checking out a whole thing you know so right it okay. makes a big difference it, it's, it a, it's a it huge discrepancy right yeah it does and then of course you know uh the last point that you know i wanted to make make about the concerns or the things that were raised about this guidance is that um you know segment of industry that's concerned about generic drug manufacturing raised the issue of cost for generics, right? This is the cost of, of installing CM and, you know, for generics is something that certainly has to be considered by, you know, industry thought leaders and, and, and we, you know, policymakers when you get right down to it. So, yeah. 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 And, and I, so I'm glad you mentioned generics because I'm just thinking about um, all this entire process. And, uh, and although, We've definitely um, begun to really make a business case for uh, CM, and we are, you know, and I am hearing, and I'm sure our listeners are too, that there are huge advantages um, in CM, but, um, you know, batch manufacturing is not going away anytime soon either. Um, because no. <laughs> I'm sure there are certain products that are, um, and I know you touched on this at the beginning, but I'm sure there are certain products that are tailor-made for the CM process, uh, just as there are others that, 
you know, really the ROI, it just isn't there to put them right. on a continuous manufacturing uh, mm-hmm. site. So what are your thoughts on some of the barriers here, whether it's cost barrier and, and does it matter if you're producing proprietary versus generic products, whether you, you would consider CM and, you know, I can imagine that retiring batch manufacturing equipment before it's natural. end, like I mentioned earlier in our discussion um, would also be costly. So does adoption of CM make more sense when introducing a new product or building a new facility? I mean, there's just a lot of um, variables out there. Can you help us understand um that process, that thought process in terms of actually making the shift and deciding to do so. Sure. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Absolutely. You're, you're, you're right. It's very true that for some products, this conversion over to CM just doesn't make a good business case. doesn't make good business sense. Right. Right. So, you know, as we mentioned, that initial, that, uh, that initial capital layout is really high. And the savings may never be realized. So I think there's, you know, I think there's always the possibility that the high cost of implementing CM would level out over time, much the way other things and commodities do. Possibly. (laughs) It's not looking like it. You know, manufacturing, form of manufacturing equipment is is not an expensive thing. So uh, anyway, what is important for companies, right, is to do an upfront analysis, right? They have to determine whether their products, whether it's drug product or API, whatever they're making, is a good candidate, right? And they need to have a screening process in place that should be adopted so that that business case can be made, right? Because when you go before... When you go before senior management or the finance team, they're going to, you know, they want to see all the dollars and cents. So you also have to take into account things like, you know, the therapy, right? Is this, is this, a, is this, you know, something that is a, a high demand product or is it, or is it an orphan drug, right? So the demand volume, and then of course the technical feasibility, all of those things have to be considered as part of this um, making the business case, right? It's a big, big undertaking to convert, from traditional batch manufacturing to, to continuous manufacturing. And there's there's a, a, there's so many things we got to factor in, right? But if we, we look at the plant, right? For to the first example, we look at the plant itself. Mm-hmm. We have to have adequate capacity in the facilities. It's a real right. thing. And depending on the plant, sometimes it's just not an, it's just not possible to install a CM line without modifying the structure of the plant or modifying that specific area of the plant, right? So from an engineering perspective, CM lines can and often do exceed vertical space over what traditional lines take up. So they they often span more than one floor or one story. So that's something else to be considered here, (laughs) whether, you know, your company will begin, you know, when you you, you do that conversion, that has to be taken into account, right? Another thing too that we we want to and, and and of course that speaks to you know when you're building a new facility it, it seems like it just would be easier right, right. Let's, let's let's build a CM line in a new plant rather than our old plant where we've got to modify it okay that's it's a lot of work it's a lot of money um, another thing too is that you know the company has to decide when when you when you do make that decision we're going with CM and we've got we've got the right portfolio of products perhaps. What are we going to do here? Are we going to do it on, on you know, what's, what's our first one out the gate going to be? Is it going to be a new product that we're going to develop? Right. Or are we going to convert over a legacy product, right? So that strategy about what to do is going to be important for your learning curve. And there's, again, no one size fits all. It's going to have to be, you know, balanced against all kinds of things within the company. Now, people and materials flow, again, when we talk about the, the physical plant space, has to be considered, right? Will those new CM lines be on their own in a separate manufacturing suite or suite of buildings, or will they be integrated near traditional batch manufacturing, right? We know from GMPs, that really doesn't tell us how to implement adequate facility considerations, but it's certainly expected as part right. of CGMP, right? And, and, and CM doesn't change that. So in this way, it certainly seems easier to install CM lines in a brand new facility, you know, rather than, than I said, as I mentioned before, you know, tearing apart what you got. Um, in terms of uh, retiring equipment before it's time, again, 
Now, that will be subject to the analysis of implementing CM for a particular product. If the demand volume is such that, you know, ROI over time, some period of time is greater than cost of operating and status quo in that same period of time, yeah, of course, then there might be a case for, you know, repurposing, re-engineering, uh, or, or just selling that old equipment, you know. Right. 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 <laughs> um, <clears throat> yeah, and, and to your question about, uh, CM for proprietary versus generic. Well, you know, that's really interesting because there are some stark contrasts to what's happening in terms of rate of adoption of continuous manufacturing by the big branded companies versus generic companies, right? Versus the vast majority of prescriptions being filled in the United States, which is something like 90% of all prescriptions filled are for generic products. Right. So at this point in time, you know, most generics are using traditional batch manufacturing and, and, you know, you know, generic companies are always tasked with keeping, keeping the cost of manufacturing low. And so that keeps the retail price low, you know, right. so using that challenge as the backdrop, it's, I, I imagine it's really hard for generics, especially the smaller companies, ones that may not have a huge catalog of offered products to justify the cost of startup expenditures there for CM. And again, we have to consider that PAT and the software for modeling and automation that are part of that setup is really quite expensive. So things like multivariate analysis of data coming off a CM line are not typically routine in traditional batch manufacturing, you know, but to be clear, and I, I'm, you know, I want to be fair here, PAT and statistical applications, you know, are certainly used in generic manufacturing as well as novel manufacturing operations. So, you know, generic industry as a mirror to the branded industry, you know, has kept pace and they've adopted, you know, what needs to be adopted, but largely within that realm of traditional manufacturing, right? Right. So a, a couple of other things too that are, you know, of a concern to the generic folks are availability of continuous manufacturing expertise in their world, right? right? We know that the thrust of CM development has been on the branded firm side, and the skill sets of associates in those branded companies working on CM, you know, have specialized pharmaceutics, process engineering, statistics, right? So, so there's a lot of folks in it. They're dedicated to it, is what I'm trying to say. So, you know, training, of course, is a related issue just to finding these subject matter experts in CM for generics, right? Some of the papers that I've seen from, you know, generic realm, papers and articles, you know, talking about this, you know, about this issue is they, they've they called for a phased approach to continuous manufacturing in plants. And, uh, you know, I think a lot, I think it's a cool idea conceptually, but a lot would have to be teased out. And, and from a regulatory perspective, you know, there's a lot of unknowns, right? Still some unknowns there for them. And their big question is about whether generics manufactured by continuous manufacturing will require new bioavailability studies, for example. So a lot uh, to be sorted out in that area. Um, but the real irony is that small molecule generics used to treat things, you know, like things, you know, hypertension, type 2 zombies, cholesterol management. These are exactly the kinds of products that would benefit from being converted over to continuous manufacturing, right? If we consider that widely held belief that CM is a pathway to improve product quality, improve safety and efficiency, and a firewall against product shortages, generics largely fit this bill of suitability. Right. They really do. Yeah. And at some point, though, generics will have to begin that conversion process because when we consider that many new drugs are being developed in the branded world using CM as, you know, and with process variability, generic firms are going to have to be ready to match that productivity when the time comes for those branded products to come off patent. Yeah, exactly. And part particularly if you think about, um, you know, at what you said at the beginning that this CM process often shortens time to market by weeks and or months, then, you know, these generic manufacturers by default should be able to get a lot more product out the door, which right. means they can, um, you know, be profiting from the sale of those products on the consumer market. Uh, and their ROI should be faster, uh, recognized faster. So uh, it seems like we would anticipate um, mm -hmm. a, a shift, at least in thinking um, yeah. within the industry. Yeah. 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 
So I guess in summary, then, in your experience, does the potential advantages um, in terms of agility of, of supply, speed of development and drug products and the increased quality that you have highlighted time and time again here offset the expense? Yeah, I, I, I do. I mean, I think the advantages do outweigh the expense over the long term, you know, in particular for those products where that demand volume is high and will remain high. Right. The immediate benefits of implementing a CM are that, you know, the real time process monitoring and, you know, improved process understanding and product quality can be realized. Things like scale flexibility, volume flexibility are all benefits. So when we think about the increased flow for supply chain, you know, the smaller environmental footprint and reduction of chemical solvents and all those things, we, we really do have to acknowledge that there are significant gains that come with converting over or implementing CM, right? So if, if we look at, you know, a, a product, which I, I, I happen to know, Prezista, right? a Janssen product, it's a solid oral tablet, it's an antiviral medication that prevents uh, HIV cells from multiplying the body. Development was initially undertaken, the CM development was initially undertaken as a collaborative with Rutgers in New Jersey, mm -hmm. and then eventually commercially installed at the Yanson Manufacturing Plant in Puerto Rico. And I, I realized here I'm skipping years of R&D <laughs> and a lot of steep and rolling learning curve that came with it. But once the approval came from FDA in 2016 for that 600 milligram tablet, it, EMA approval followed on pretty quickly. And then the gate was kind of opened, right? We knew, you know, that was the first one to go. And now there's there's m m multiple, um, you know, strengths of Prezista tablets that, that go. But, but right. one of the big benefits was, you know, operating costs were reduced. The amount of the Runevere API for persistent was reduced and an increased product volume was realized. So, you know, consistent quality, elimination of manual handling, um, all of those things are things that, you know, the company definitely touts as benefits in addition to, to everything else that we talked about previously. Yeah. Right. Right. For sure. For sure. Well, thank you. Yeah. That's good to have that example of an actual product that has gone through this process and, um, you realize the financial benefit, um, you know, to the operating costs, reduction in operating costs um, right away. And, yep. and mm -hmm. now everything else is just like yep. bonus. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Well, Renee, I, I want to think about this past year where we've really seen an acceleration in the adoption of digital technologies across uh, the globe, not just in our industry, but certainly in industry as well. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, as we learn to remote work and remote audit and um, <laughs> validate and, and all of our things um, th remotely and using digital technologies. Do you anticipate this trend? that uh, we've seen this last year or really 15 months now will have an impact on the rate at which uh, we as an industry now adopt continuous manufacturing? Well, I'm certainly hopeful for that, right? <laughs> so, you know, as we discussed, there's big hurdles to converting or adopting CM um, or even adopting it from the outset of product development. But you know what? Industry always answers the call, right? I think our industry is fantastic at adapting and, and forging forward. And I, I think that the partnership with FDA or any global health authority is going to be really important as the agency preserves this current environment of cooperation. I think we're going to see more and more adoption of CM. And we already know that big pharma companies are doing drug development you know, they're right. pipeline candidates with continuous manufacturing as a means of commercial production. So to me, it, it's looking hopeful, right? I'm an optimist. I, I think it's, I think it's looking good. <laughs> I'm glad to hear that. I mean, it, it certainly would be um, advantageous to the industry because you can think about some other industries such as chemical and petrochemical, right. you know, they've long since adopted this continuous manufacturing yeah. Uh, model. But, you know, pharma has been historically much slower to embrace uh, not only continuous manufacturing, but many new technologies. So what do you sure. think then a realistic timeline is for a shift to CM? If well, you had a guess. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's kind of difficult to answer, right? Um, and I, I think it's clear enough, right, to understand why our pharma industry has been slow to adopt continuous manufacturing over the other ones. Um, you know, we maintain compliance to a very, very high bar of standards, right? And that's what 
all companies in the pharma business have to do. Mm -hmm. And so with that comes, you know, risk aversion and hesitancy to step out and certainly hesitancy to, you know, put up the capital to make big, gigantic changes, right? So um, as we've seen with other companies who were some of the first ones to get into the CM game, there there was a strong collaboration with FDA along the way. And uh, continuous manufacturing has been and continues to be a mutually beneficial learning experience for industry and for, you know, FDA and for other health agencies. So, you know, as we embrace uh, all those benefits that CM offers, um, I, I do tend to believe, right, especially given the events of the last, you know, 15, 18 months, as you say, with the ex- we've seen accelerated development and approvals of public health emergency vaccines that we're going to see that shift to CM pick up particularly as we see FDA and other health authorities put out more guidelines and establish programs for things like quality metrics, right? Right. We know that FDA is very attuned to development that leans on measured risk-based approach. And I think that fits very well with the overall vision about CM and what continuous manufacturing facilitates. Excellent. Renee, so much great information relayed here um, and some very thought provoking ideas about just what it takes to uh, implement CM in a facility and all of the different factors that need to be considered. So I really appreciate all that you've shared so far. Um, And as we get ready to wrap up here today, I just want to see if there's any last thoughts or bits of information that you'd like to leave with our listeners. Sure. Um, um, and, and thank you very much for the opportunity. It's, it's, been, it's been really, really fun to talk about this. Uh, it's, continuous manufacturing is, is part of the future of pharmaceutical manufacturing. So, so you know, I, I say take whatever opportunity you can to learn about it, see it if, if that's possible, and, and keep an eye out for more and more approvals of continuous manufacturing products coming from FDA and, glo- and other global health authorities, right? There's a huge amount of material and online resources if you're, you know, ready to dive in. Absolutely. Thank you. And we will link to some of those materials and resources in the show notes. So for our listeners, be sure to check those out and uh, do some additional learning uh, in your free time. But Anyway, Renee, I want to thank you so much for being here with us today. It's been such a pleasure to have you. Thank you, Stacey. It was my pleasure, too. Absolutely. Thank you again to Renee Phillips for being our guest today. We really appreciate the expertise and vision on this topic. Also, I want to give a shout out to our producer, Ben Kitchen. Lastly, I'm sending out my appreciation to you, our valued listeners. I'm grateful for your time each week and for your help in sharing this podcast, which has led to our tremendous growth this last year. As always, if you enjoyed today's episode, please remember to subscribe in your podcast player of choice and be sure to share it with your friends, colleagues, and online networks so they can enjoy it too. Plus, send us a quick note or leave an online review. We'd really love to share your feedback with our network. For show notes and additional podcast resources, please visit www.ivtnetwork.com backslash podcast. We'll be back again next week with another innovative and insightful discussion. Until then, make it a great week.